I'm here with Chris Burwell, a retired RAF group captain who, amongst other things, flew Harriers for the Air Force, commanded number one squadron and was the station commander of the famous wartime RAF bomber station Scampton, which launched the Dam Busters raid on the dams of the Ruhr Valley. After leaving the RAF, amongst other things, he went on to work for the company Cobham, who were providing operational targets for the UK military, along with electronic countermeasures and flight calibration of airfield navigation equipment. Uh, many thanks indeed for giving us your time, Chris. I wonder if you could start by describing what your book, Nine Lives, is about. Well, thank you very much for coming to interview me, Nick. It's, um, the book Nine Lives is basically about my career in aviation. So it doesn't cover my whole life story. It's not intended to. It's really a book that covers what I got up to in almost 50 years in aviation. So it starts with uh, when I joined the cadet force at school and my early flying gliding in, in this case, and then on to powered flying with a flying scholarship, then into the Air Force, what I got up to into the Air Force over 30 years, and then, as you mentioned, going into Cobham for 12 years, at which point I retired, uh, but then got dragged out of retirement to go and work down in Spain for four years. So my last four years in aviation were actually down in Spain with a commercial flying training school. So I spanned military through to uh, Cobham, which was military support, and then into commercial aviation on the flying training side. Your start in the Air Force um, seems to parallel most of that generation who were keen enough to become cadets and engage in all that was available to them because you've already mentioned yeah. your gliding courses and flight yeah. scholarships. Uh, things are somewhat different nowadays. Do you think enough's being done to encourage young people to take up a military flying career? Well, I, it's a very difficult one because we all know money is tight these days. Um, I can look back on my time and probably the same for you, Nick, and see that um, there was a lot of opportunity for us. Um, I did some gliding at school. Um, I then did a flying scholarship. And I'm not sure that there is that much available these days in that respect. And when I sp um, look at university air squadrons, it's amazing how little flying the um, guys who are interested in the Air Force seem to get on university air squadrons. I mean, in my day, I think they were getting at least 30 hours a year flying. I think it's a lot less than that these days. So I, I think, you know, we all know money is tight. It's it, defence, like all other sectors of, um, of government, is very tight. And it's a matter of making the money go where it can best be spent. And particularly, it must go to the front line. Uh, but that is not to say that we shouldn't be doing what we can to recruit the best people into the Royal Air Force. You did uh, your training at RAF College Cranwell, but I read in the book you seem to have done quite a lot without much supervision, particularly <laughs> down potholes. How do you compare those character building yeah. days with what might be allowed today? Well, it's, that's a very good question, Nick, because when I look back on, when I, when I got to write about this in the book, I was thinking, did we really do those things without supervision? And the fact is, we did. Uh, we, we had an officer who oversaw what we were doing with the potholing club, but a very good friend of mine, Dave Harlan, and myself, basically got the potholing club going again. And we hadn't done a lot of potholing. We'd done a bit, but we decided that there was this club, it was more or less defunct, but we got it going. There was a senior flight cadet who took an interest and he was nominally in charge, but Dave and myself were the drivers there. And we used to go up to the Yorkshire Dales for the weekends and just go potholing. And at Cranwell, they knew what we were doing, but there was absolutely no supervision whatsoever. We were responsible for it. We were junior cadets. We'd only been in the Air Force a matter of a few months, and we were off doing this completely unsupervised. And then at the end of the first year at Cranwell, uh, we went on an expedition down to the Ligurian Alps in Italy. And again, I think there were sort of six of us. We got the minibus from the college piled ourselves into it and some potholing gear and went off down to the Ligurian Alps and spent a week down on the, um, on the Mediterranean. We did do a bit of potholing, but we also spent quite a lot of time on the beach and eating pizzas and things like that. We had a great time, but it, it, were, it was character building stuff. We were like 18, 19 years old and we were given that responsibility, which I think is great. And I think these days, perhaps, we tend to mollycoddle people a bit too much. We don't give them enough slack to get out and do these, these uh, challenging things on their own. 
at the end of your Valley course on that, you had experienced more than your share of tragedy, and perhaps you could go into that a little. You talk as if it was an inevitable part of military flying of the era. Do you still think like that, or do you think that more could have been done to save lives? <sighs> Difficult question. I, I, yes, I had experienced things. We'd lost uh, one of our cadets at Cranwell. Uh, he was actually not on my entry. He was two entries ahead of me. And at, Cram at uh, Valley, we had a mid-air collision which killed two of the guys on my course. Um, so, yeah, we were subjected to this. Um, it, it is, yes, an inevitability of military flying. It doesn't just apply to fast jets, it applies across the board because you are asking people to take sometimes some fairly complex um, technology breaking aircraft into the air and do some very demanding things with it. So it's inevitable that occasionally things will go wrong. It may be with the aircraft, it may be pilot error or crew error or whatever, but these things do happen. It's not like flying an airliner. You're operating quite often in a difficult, demanding environment. Um, but if you go back 20 years before I was at Valley, they were losing a lot more people. I mentioned in the book about my flight commander when I was um, a first tour instructor at Linton News. He'd written off two meteors in two weeks at one point. I mean, these things happened. He survived, but a lot of guys in those days didn't. The meteor was quite a dangerous aircraft, asymmetrically, as most people are probably aware. And a lot of people were killed um, just flying meteors and vampires and the early jets around. And a lot more than were being killed in my day. But even so, it was a fact of life that you were going to lose friends and colleagues and people you knew quite well. And in the Harrier Force, that was certainly the case. Could we be doing more about it or should we have been doing more about it? Um, a very difficult one. Again, as the years went on in my time in the military, we got very focused on trying to stay safe. I'm not saying it wasn't happening when I was at Valley and doing my early training, but flight safety grew during the time that I was in the military quite rightly. People were aware of the risks and a lot was done to mitigate those risks. Um, but as I say, by nature of the environment in which you're operating, it is a risky business and always has been. The technology of the aircraft were improving all the time as yes. well, though that must have helped. And of course, the technology in the escape systems. Correct. Right, you know, yeah. The days of 1990 ejector seats or yes. worse had yes. gone by the time we started training people on the Hawk, for yeah. example. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. You considered the Harrier as the top aircraft to be posted onto. Mm. Now, why was that? Well, it was revolutionary. Uh, it was when I was going through flying training, it was just coming into service. Um, in fact, the Harrier came into service in 1969, the same year I joined the Air Force. So as the Harrier was built up, obviously they used experienced pilots on it initially, but by the time I went through training and by the time I was at Valley in 1972, they were starting to take the first first tour pilots onto the Harrier. And in fact, two of the guys on my course were posted to the Harrier. Um, and so it was a revolutionary aircraft. It was brand new. It was very exciting. You know, you could just see it was going to be an amazing aircraft to be involved with. So it was, it was a great thing to aim for. Now, a lot of pilots would have been frustrated to then be posted from training to become a QFI yeah. instead of a frontline pilot, but you seem to accept it with equanimity. Mm. Weren't you a bit frustrated? No, I wasn't actually. Um, it's, it's, it's strange looking back on it, but I actually enjoy my flying training very much from the time I started on Chipmunks up at Perth on the Flying Scholarship right the way through. I had a very good run through training. I had, uh, I had a lot of respect for my flying instructors. I thought they were all very good. I had a diverse, they all had diverse backgrounds. Uh, I had one bad experience at Valley with a flying instructor. Otherwise, I had a great experience. And I thought if I could aspire to that level of professionalism and help people come through and learn how to fly, that would be a good thing to do. And I thought it'd be great to do it straight away. And it's, it would be a bit of an accolade. Now, also coupled with that was the fact that I could see that I was not going to be top of the course at Valley because my um, 
very good friend Paul Hopkins was definitely going to be up there. Um, I wasn't going to be there. And there was another guy on the course, a guy called Bob Mason, who was also very good. And in fact, as it turned out, Paul and Bob came first and second on the course. I can't remember which order it is. It doesn't matter. I came third on the course. There weren't three Harrier postings anyway, so I wasn't going to go to Harrier's. So if I had finished up going to another aircraft type at that stage, I would almost certainly never have flown the Harrier. Um, because you tended to go, if you went to Phantoms like you did, then you tended to stay in the air defence world and finished up on F3s. Um, if I'd gone to Jaguar, there was very little chance I would have crossed over to Harrier. Um, you would never have wanted to fly the Jaguar, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no comment there, no comment. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you seem to have enjoyed your short time as a cure fight. It was mm. only two and a half years, mm. lucky man. Mm. But you don't talk a lot about your successful students. Were there any standout pilots who you trained? Um, not personally. Um, I had a checkered, the students I had, checkered um, outcome, to be honest. Uh, one or two of them didn't make it. Uh, one of them got into the fighter stream. I tell the story in the book, actually. He got into the fighter stream at Valley, but failed to get through the Valley course. Uh, my most successful one finished up as a search and rescue helicopter pilot, to be honest. Oh, a very noble job. Yes, very noble. And he, he had a good career doing search and rescue uh, for a number of years with the Royal Air Force. So, yes, it was a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, but I would say at this point... Uh, there were two standout students that went through um, with me uh, whilst I was instructing on the courses that we looked after. Uh, one of them was Clive Loder, um, who, who's, who became the uh, Commander-in-Chief of Air Command. He was the first Commander-in-Chief of Air Command as it moved from Strike Command to Air Command. So he was one of our students. And a, another one was um, Chris Rayner, who's a very good friend of mine. I still see him very regularly. Now, the interesting thing about those two guys was when they came through our training, um, they both wanted to go and fly the Harrier. And, uh, you know, that was the pinnacle. And um, you could see that they were good. And uh, they made it quite clear that they wanted to fly the Harrier. And I think I remember rightly that they both had stickers in their logbook where they handed their logbook in at the end of every month, as you probably remember, Nick, where they had to be signed. And they put Harrier stickers in there. And interestingly enough, both those guys knew where they wanted to go and they both got there. There's no doubt about it that uh, motivation certainly mm -hmm. aids. It uh, is brilliant. Yeah. Um, your first Harrier tour on one squadron reads like a travelogue, but not necessarily to the most attractive or comfortable places in the world. I'm thinking of Tromso in northern Norway and the jungles of Belize, <laughs> often camping in the field. Yes. I'm guessing that sort of life could be fun for a while, but did the novelty eventually wear off? Um, I, I didn't have long enough for it to wear off because I was short toured. I only did two years on one squadron. I, yes, I had a great time. It was a great experience. You say about Tromso but not being a very nice place. Tromso is a great place, actually. It's called the Paris of the Arctic Circle. Right. So it's, um, and I have, I have memories of um, coming out of um, a pub at three o'clock in the morning with the sun still up and all that sort of thing. It's, it's an amazing place, Tromso. But yes, Tromso, camping in Denmark, uh, going into Belize and all that sort of thing. It was, it was a very formative two years, first two years that I had on the Harrier Force. A really good experience. Of course, it didn't pull with me because I was actually all up for going out to Germany and doing more of the same out in Germany, especially field work, um, taking the Harriers out into the field. But sadly, I then got short toured because they needed me as an instructor up on the conversion unit, 200 yards up the airfield. So that's where I went. You're, yeah, you, you mentioned at the short time you were on your first tour. It must have been a very steep learning curve because you seem to achieve an awful lot in mm. those few years. Yeah. Well, I joined the squadron, yeah, we joined the squadron, Chris Gowers and myself, in November. And mid-summer, we were off to Belize uh, on the reinforcement with the Guatemalans threatening to uh, invade the country. So um, both Chris and myself, who at that stage had been on the squadron for about eight months, I suppose, were both um, frank to fly aircraft across the Atlantic out to our refueling, obviously. So, you know, you're, you're seven, eight months into your first tour and you suddenly guns loaded off across the Atlantic to confront the Guatemalans.